Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Rougarou Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 310 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, of course, by the former heavyweight world title challenger himself, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing, man? I'm good, my man. How about you? I'm doing very, very well. It's a big week for the podcast. This podcast uh, marks um, the 310th one, like I say, 52 uh 52 weeks in a year uh, we missed two shows once that's why we haven't had um you know 312 podcasts but we've had 312 weeks since the podcast started 310 podcasts now with this one so yeah it is our 6 year anniversary uh the day this goes out on Thursday so that is incredible uh, Thursday the 20 20- third of september um so yeah it's been a wild six years i just want to thank all the loyal listeners that i'm sure will be listening to me as i speak right now and of course all the guests that we've had on over the times you know like we've had i think it's 120 something world champions um you know hundreds and hundreds of guests and um just everyone yourself as well eddie the 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 co-hosts that have joined me over the over the years and you know Myself and you have got a good thing going here. So, um, yeah, I just want to thank you, too, while you're here. Not a problem, man. It's always good to be a part of something great. So let's just keep it going. Let's keep it going. Right, let's dive straight into the review part of the show. We're going to start here with a card that took place on Thursday at the Quiet Cannon Country Club in Montebello, California, USA, over here. Just one fight to mention, the main event. Sir Guy Bohachuk, the... uh, you know, the Ukrainian fighter, now 20-1, and one, a KO in round six against Rafael Ibokwi, who's now 16-3. and three. Uh, Serhai Bohachuk once again doesn't go the distance, so 21 fights now, he's never been the distance, a KO in round six, like I say. I think the corner of Ibokwi stopped the fight there. Uh, moving out now to the 2300 Arena in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. Over here, Jesse Hart returned with a win. It was it was his 30th pro fight. He's now 27-3. and three, A unanimous decision wide in the end against Mike Guy, who's now 12-7 and seven with a draw. Mike Guy, very, very tough. Um, on last week's show, we had John Ryder on. John Ryder boxed Mike Guy. I couldn't get him out of there. Jesse Hart couldn't get him out of there. Um, I think he's only been stopped once in his seven losses. That was pretty much how I expected it to go. A wide point to him for Jesse Hart. Moving out now to the Mecca in Regent Circus Swindon. Just a, just just one fight to mention over here. We're flying through this review part. This is the final fight of the review part to mention. Luke the Duke Watkins, friend of the show, now 15-2. and two. A KO for him in round one against Tyrone Williams, who's now 1-3. Like I said, I've flown through the review part there. Not too much to go over from last week. Just before we bring in our guest, it's now time to thank our sponsor. This podcast is sponsored by Manscaped, but the opinions expressed are those of myself and former heavyweight world title challenger Eddie Chambers. As you should all know by now, Manscaped are a leading brand in below-the-waist grooming. You've either heard of them or you haven't. If you have heard of them and you're on the fence about placing an order, I'm here to help you with that decision. If you haven't heard of them, then I seriously need you to listen up. I have tried a range of their products now, and I'm giving my honest opinions based on my own experiences with these particular products. Now, the Lawnmower 4.0, which is used for trimming your bush, has an incredible battery life. I haven't yet charged it, and I've had it since early August, and I turned it on again today. It's still perfectly working, so the battery life is quite incredible. I also haven't come close to nipping myself with the blade. It glides and slides easily on all surfaces, leaving you in full control of how much hair you decide to remove down there. 
Uh, the ball deodorant, myself and Eddie are crazy about this. We've said it a few times. It smells incredible. I cannot praise this product enough. I use it every single day. The ball toner and refresher, if you give yourself a few sprays down there, it's a real confidence booster. I was giving it about two to three sprays at first. I love it so much. I'm now spraying it about seven or eight times. It is just unbelievable. The fragrance is long lasting. I've never smelled anything quite like it. They've got the weed whacker, which is a nose and ear hair trimmer. This works very well also. I myself have never used the nose and ear hair trimmer before, so it was my first time, and I really like the way this thing trims. Those four products I've just mentioned, the weed whacker, the lawnmower 4.0, the ball toner and refresher, and the ball deodorant are all products I've personally tried out. You do not have to buy all of them. You can visit manscaped.com and buy just one product if you wish. They've got a whole host of products on there and you can choose whatever you want. All products also come with a 30-day money-back guarantee. But if you do want everything I've just described, it all comes in one package. Yes, the Manscaped Performance Package 4.0. You'll get everything I described and you'll also get disposable shaving mats and two free gifts a pair of anti-chafing boxer shorts and a travel bag perfect for keeping your manscaped products inside please visit manscaped.com and use the promo code box hard or one word for 20 percent off and free shipping and who knows maybe you'll have people running back to your sack you must all be fools if you haven't manscaped your balls Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated super lightweight contender, ranked number one in the world with the WBO. It is, of course, Mr. Jack Catterall. Jack, welcome back on the show, my friend. Oh, nice one, mate. Thank you very much. Good to and be it's back. It's a pleasure to have you back. So we last spoke, believe it or not, back in July of 2018. It's been a it's been a good while. Uh, it was just before the <laughs> O'Hara Davies fight. Obviously, you won that fight, a good win. Since then, you've picked up another three wins. Um, however, is it fair to say, Jack, that you hadn't really pushed on after that O'Hara Davies win um, until this fight, of course, got made? Yeah, it's been uh, it's been a bit of a difficult one since then. Uh, Picked up the win against O'Hara, uh, and that put me in the number one position for, with the WBO. Uh, <clears throat> and then since then, up until now, it's been like a it's, it's been a difficult time. Uh, I've been in the gym since then. Uh, picked up a couple wins, probably not the the fights that I wanted, uh, that I certainly felt felt ready for. But ultimately. We're here now. I've got the fight against Josh Taylor, uh, and it's kind of like, I mean, you could say I, I was going to get me shot at the WBO title, but now I'm getting me shot at all the marbles, so it's come tenfold. Uh, but come December, I'll be ready to take it all. Yeah, and you know, real boxing people have known about you for years. People used to always talk about you sparring Mayweather and Canelo. Uh, you're still undefeated all these years later. Obviously, you mentioned you've been ranked number one by the WBO for a long time. And as you say, um, you, you know, you stepped aside to allow Taylor to fight Ramirez for the right to become undisputed. Um, what did you make of their fight? And I'm sure you feel you did the right thing letting them fight. Now you've got a crack at all the belts. Yeah, there was always the risk of 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 a stepping aside and, and not getting the fight. I mean, we all know how it works in boxing. Taylor could have easily moved up and choose to to fight one of the, the boys at 147. So there was always that risk uh, going into this fight. But uh, credit to Taylor, he kept his word and we're here now. But <coughs> sorry, sorry, I forgot the rest of the question. No, I was saying, obviously, you feel like you did the right thing allowing that to happen. Um, and just tell me about their fight, what you thought about their fight. It was a great fight back in May. Yeah, brilliant fight. So, uh, you probably know I went out to watch the fight. Uh, yeah. I've been I've been chasing that WBO belt. I've been to, been to a few of the fights. And even when uh, Hooker had the fight, uh, when he had the WBO belt, I've, I've made a point of going all, out there and watching the fights and I'm chasing the title down, and then I went to watch the the fight for all four belts against Taylor Ramirez, and a cracking fight. Uh, uh, I fought Taylor box very well. There was stuff that I seen in the fight that that I thought he could have done differently. Ramirez boxed really well. He had he had quite a bit of success, and then he kind of like the fight got turned on its head after after one of the knockdowns, and Taylor kind of ran away with it. Ramirez stopped throwing the punches and 
stop doing the stuff that was working early on in the fight for him. Uh, but it was it was good to be to be there at the fight live watching and, and getting a feel for it. And what's your relationship like with Josh Jack? I remember watching that. I think it was an IFL interview you did, and the interviewer FaceTime Josh. It seemed friendly at times, and then a bit awkward at others. Yeah, I wouldn't say that there's too much of a relationship or, or anything there. Uh, <clears throat> I went out to watch Taylor Ramirez, and I was actually on my own. Uh, we're under the same management banner, and his team were quite welcoming. Uh, I spent time with his team before and after the fight. Uh, Josh Josh invited us out after after his win against Ramirez, but didn't, didn't uh, choose to go out. I thought, you know what, he, he's earned the right to go and enjoy himself. So uh, I'm guessing he went and did that. But uh, there's, there's, I will not say there's any bad blood there, uh, any real friendship. It, it's a business. Uh, the fight was easily made with us both being under MTK. Uh, and it's just a job for me, I think. Uh, I don't think we'll ever be ringing each other up, going for going for a drink, catching up, but I don't think there'll be any nasty words spoken. Uh, we've both got a job to do. Uh, Josh knows what he's got to do, and I know what I've got to do. So uh, we'll touch gloves December 18th and let the, the fist do the talking. And December 18th is the day, obviously, it takes place in Glasgow. Um, how do you see the fight unfolding, Jack? Because Josh is a guy that some people struggle to see a weakness. You know, he's a big puncher. He's got good feet. He can fight on the inside and the outside. He seems to be a good body puncher with a good chin. Do you see a weakness in him? What do you feel you have over him? Of course. I feel like come December 18th, all the stuff I've been working on, it won't just be a case of, of having a 12, 14 week training camp, this is the time to, to put together everything I've been doing over the last 10, 15 years. And I don't believe I've come to my peak yet. I think that's still still in the future, but I believe I'll be able to match Josh Fall in things. But ultimately, I think I'll be able to take away his strengths and, sh- and show what I can do. I think a fighter like Josh, that's, that's explosive, that starts fast, that comes forward, that can do all them things you mentioned. I think that will only raise my levels and show what I'm capable of. Uh, and I truly believe fight. that December the 18th, going into that fight, I will be in the best condition I've ever been in. I'll be able to go out there and, and show the world what I can do. Yeah, I'm so much looking forward to it. Obviously, Jack, you're coming off as well. Um, it must be said, the career uh, longest layoff, 13 months. Is that a concern at all on your part? Uh, listen, it's not an, I- an ideal situation, Uh there was probably a chance to get a fight in between that, but uh, the way it worked out, it would have been too close and, and too high risk to have that fight. Going into fighting Josh, uh, being the risk of getting cut, injuries, etc. But there would be no excuses my side. I've been in the gym uh, with my strength coaches, with the boxing coaches, with my running coaches <laughs> for, for however long. Uh, certainly not took me off the ball. I've been sparring regularly stages where I've need to have sparred uh, I've been living well uh, and I'm ultimately deterring the best I can to beat Josh so no I, I think uh, I think I was speaking to was it Callum Smith after he was out the ring for X amount of months but there's options to come back at a lower level and I think I'd have done myself an injustice doing that coming back beating somebody I should be and I don't think I'd have really got the kick for it but uh now we've got the fight we wanted. It's time to put everything together in camp and uh, put on a performance. And I think last week or the week before, we saw Matram annoyingly announce that on the same date as you, we're going to get the, the rematch between Chisora and Joseph Parker. Um, it's not ideal for anyone. Is that something that's annoyed you a bit? It's annoyed us as boxing fans, for sure. Yeah, for me, I mean, it makes no difference to me. I'll be focused on me, but... I guess for the boxing fans, for the mad boxing fans, it, it's not ideal. I mean, I'm only 30 minutes from Manchester where the fight's going to be. Uh, but I've certainly not heard anybody say to me that I've already said they're coming up to Glasgow to watch this fight change their mind. So hopefully it stays that way. Uh, it's not ideal, but I'm, I'm sure a lot more people would rather see me and Josh fight than that fight again not even put the undercard together yet, which I guess is going to be a 
a big undercard. So, uh, I think I can only focus on what's in front of me and turn no mind to, to whatever the promoters are getting up to. And it is a big fight week. I've got to ask your prediction. Joshua, you sick. Everyone just has no idea. They're like, you sick, Joshua, knockout points. No one's got a clue. What's your What's your uh, viewpoint on that one? Yeah, a couple of uh, lads and girls in the gym was discussing it and everybody seems to be pulled a different way. But uh, the, thing I, the way I think it unfolds is I think for the first six rounds or so, you're not going to see too much in the rounds. I think uh, they're both quite cute. I think after the sixth round, after the midway point, I think we're going to see Joshua uh, put it together then and I'm going for Joshua late stoppage or Joshua points. Joshua late stoppage or Joshua points. Okay, yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be quite cagey early on. We shall see. Um, I want to ask you as well, if if you have one, Jack, I don't want to put you on the spot at all. Um, if you've got a final prediction for your fight, do you see it going all 12 rounds? I certainly believe I've got the power to hurt Josh, uh, but I'm just going to go out there with the intention of beating him, beating him good and clear. Uh, and I expect no favours off the judges going up to Scotland uh, in his hometown, taking all the belts. I'll be going out there to do everything I can to, to make sure I do it in style. Absolutely. And just finally, Jack, before we wrap it up, if you've got any closing words to the listeners, like I say, you haven't been on for a few years, you're back on and you've got, you know, the biggest of fights possible right in front of you. Yeah, just uh, thanks again for everybody who's been supporting us throughout the years. Uh, we're back at December the 18th. Uh, we've not took our eye off the ball. We've got the biggest fight in my career. And uh, I hope everybody can tune in Sky Sports and come and support us. There we go. Well said. Will the four belts be going back to Chorley? We shall see December 18th. Listen, Jack, it's been a real pleasure catching up with you. Best of luck for the 18th of December, and we'll catch up sometime after, I'm sure. Oh, thank you very much for having me on. God bless, and hopefully we catch up soon. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. We're going to start here uh, with a piece of news. I think we should start with this one. Uh, Connor Ben has signed a new multi-fight deal with Matram. I'm not sure how many fights they they uh, you know have signed for, but he's going to be there, of course, for a multi-fight deal. So that means two or more. Um, I think they're looking at him perhaps returning in December. So that's good stuff there for Connor Ben. We have the news that Richard Schaefer is launching a new or has launched a new boxing and media company. It's going to be called. Well, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it, it seems like it's. Probellum, which is like it's spelled P R O B E L L U M. I don't know if that's like Probellum or Probellum or Probellum. It can be said many different ways. But, anyways, they're looking to do big things apparently in the sport. Uh, Richard Schaefer, a friend of the show, I remember you know having a long, in depth interview with him. Um, he was great to speak to. I remember when you call up his office, you, you wait for him to answer the phone, and you've got Michael Jackson thriller playing while while you're waiting for him to pick up. Um, but anyways, back to the serious stuff. Yeah, he's launching this this company here, and they're looking at putting on some huge shows and working with all types of promoters. He's trying to kind of eradicate these uh, egos that we we see between promotional companies and other promotional companies and networks he wants to work with everyone all around the globe and he's talking about heavily investing in grassroots boxing worldwide so uh, that'll be interesting because Richard Schaefer is quite um, good at what he does um, elsewhere there, there's been a, a fight announced for the Fury Wilder free undercard we've got Julian Williams taking on Vladimir Hernandez so that one should be interesting there and also um, we have Edgar Belanga versus Marcelo Caceres. That is on the undercard as well. Um, Anthony Joshua has signed a, a new deal this week with Matram, and it's a career-long promotional deal. So that means he will finish his career with Matram Sports, the the place he you know he started, the the same promotional team he started with. So him and Eddie Hearn sticking together from the you know from the first hurdle right to the last. Um, and in other news, it's a fight that's been added to the Dillian White undercard on October 30th. We will see Lucas Big Daddy Brown travel to the UK to take on 
Alan the Savage Babich. So all the best to Lucas Brown there, friend of the show. But it's a tough ask, and you know, after after losing last time out, I think it was to a rugby player. It doesn't look good. I don't think many people giving him a chance there. Um, yeah, so let's move on now to the preview part of the show. We're going to start here with a card that takes place later today um, in the Centre Videotron in Quebec City, Canada. Over here we have Arslanbek um, Makhmadov, 12-0. and 0. He gets in with Erkan Tepa, 21-3. I remember Tepa knocking out David Price and then I think subsequently failing a drugs test and I don't think he was really given a proper ban. Uh, very, very strange circumstances. It was supposed to be a no contest and then... They they didn't make it a no contest with David Price, and it's just kind of been hit and miss from there. He lost to Christian Hammer, Marius Wack, Robert Hellenius, and here he is. I mean, he, he hasn't beaten anyone with a winning record since 2017. Um, and yeah, he gets in with Magmadov, who of course is coming off... Um, you know, a couple wins, a couple decent wins. He beat Jonathan Rice. He beat Sam Peter, former opponent of Eddie Chambers here. Um, but yeah, very good amateur was Makhmadov. Boxed in the WSB, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, that should be quite interesting. He's got 12 KOs as well, so I wouldn't imagine that's going to be a quick fight. Uh, sorry, a long fight. Uh, moving out now to Pat Squaro in Michoacan, Mexico over here. Friend of the show, former IBF. Um, super welterweight world champion Carlos Molina, 37-12 and 12 with two draws in a 10-rounder here against Juan Carlos Regosa, who's 17-17 17 and 17 with three draws. Molina um, having his first fight since losing in Coventry to Sam Eggington. Um, it's a rematch, by the way, between Molina and Regosa. I think they boxed one or two years ago. So all the best to Carlos there. Very good friend of mine. Moving out now to Germany. One fight to mention over here. Avni Yildirim, 22-4, and four, having his second comeback fight after losing to Jack Cullen. He's in an eight-rounder against Dominic Ameri, who's 14-21. and 21. He's been very, very active, Yildirim. I think he's boxed in three, um, three months in a row. I think August, Sept... Oh, sorry, August... No, I think July, August, and now September here. Uh, moving out now to Spain. One fight to mention over here. Former middleweight king Sergio Martinez, 53-3 and three with two draws in a 10-rounder against Britain's very own Brian the Lion Rose, 32-6 and six with a draw. Um, Brian Rose, friend of the show. I really hope he can do it. You know, it's a, it's um, quite a big step up for Sergio Martinez in term in terms of his returning opposition. Um, he hasn't really boxed anyone since he's made this this um, unexpected comeback. And Brian Rose, you know, sometimes he's been awful, but then I think it was the fight he had against who did he box? Um, did he box? Um, I think he boxed um, Fitzy. I'm sure he boxed Fitzy. I need to go check that now. Um, no, he boxed Anthony Fowler. Yeah, and he gave him a hard fight. I know I, I was mixing Anthony Fowler up there with uh, <laughs> with with Scott Fitzgerald, which is a crime over here in the UK. But yeah, um, he looked quite good in that Anthony Fowler fight, despite losing the fight. Um, since then, he's had the one fight, because that was two years ago. Since then, he's had the one fight. It was back in March, and it was in Spain. And now he's back in Spain, like I say, taking on Sergio Martinez on Martinez's very own promoted card. So all the best to Brian Rose. And the final card to mention, it's the big one. Tottenham Hotspur Stadium in London. Let's start with the undercard. We have... Um, Campbell Hatton, 3-0. and He's stepping in with Sonny Martinez, who's 2-4. and That's over six rounds there. I think that's the first time Campbell Hatton has boxed for six rounds. Um, still in search of of win, uh, sorry, the first knockout win of his career. Uh, we have Maxim Prodan, 19-0 and with a draw. The Ukrainian fighter that has, um, you know, nationality in Romania but lives in Italy. Very strange. Um, he's got 15 KOs. He steps in with Florian Marku. This fight's been pushed back a couple of times, I believe. Uh, that should be quite good. It's, it's always good to see Marku fight. That one's for the IBF International Welterweight title. We've got Callum Smith, 27-1, um, coming off that loss to Canelo back in December. And he has moved up in weight here to 175. He takes on Lenin Castillo, who's 21-3 with a draw, 16 KOs, never been stopped in his three losses, which came to Marcus Brown. Dimitri Bivol and Joseph Williams so good company 
Um, you know, everyone he's he's boxed, real good fighters there. Um, so yeah, Callum Smith, can he get a stoppage? I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Um, we've got Lawrence Sokoli making his first defense of his WBO Cruiserweight World title. He takes on Dylan Prasovic, who is from Montenegro. Um, yeah, he's got 12 KOs himself. Could be interesting. Haven't seen anything of Prasovic. I'm not going to... I'm not going to kid you there. And the main event, Anthony Joshua, 24-1, and defending the WBA, IBF, IBO, and WBO heavyweight world titles against the undefeated former cruiserweight king, Alexander Usyk. 18-0 um, and 0, Usyk, 13 KOs. Obviously, Anthony Joshua, like I say, 24-1, and 1, 22 KOs. I'm going to come to you straight away, Eddie, because I feel like you're going to make a better case than me anyway, and I will steal some of what you've said and form my own case afterwards. So what do you think about this tremendous fight that we're all very excited for? Well, in this fight, um, I haven't really seen... Who do we see beside, uh, you know, big Southpaw? We think we talk about Southpaw. Who do we see? I think it was... Um, Charles Martin. Was Charles Martin. There you go. Charles Martin was the only one that I remember seeing him fight, and he made quick work of that. So it's kind of hard to determine whether or not, in an, in an extended period, would that he would be bothered by a southpaw or not. I'm not sure. You know what I mean? It's hard to say. But with Usyk, you know, and his cutesy footwork and style, I mean, he's you know, he's not he's not really flashy necessarily, but he he does have uh, a way about his uh, footwork and just his foot pressure and a lot of feints, a lot of you know, kind of like in a Tyson Fury kind of way to a, a little bit with um, a lot of, you know, uh, foot feints and head feints and things like that. Um, he can make it an interesting fight for sure, but it's just how how willing will he be to, you know, get into a firefight with Anthony Joshua? Obviously, I would be, you know, pretty, <laughs> pretty, pretty ridiculous to even think that he would do it. I would figure he would probably uh, lean more toward boxing. And trying to, as much as he can to use the South Paul event, Paul advantage. And most of the time, though, when I'm looking at Usyk, he's a six three South Paul, right? He generally uses range well. You understand what I'm saying? Now he generally uses range well, like I said, the feints and all that. So I'm looking at that and I'm saying, how does he do that with Anthony Joshua? I mean, I've seen a guy slightly shorter than Joshua and um, uh, Joseph Parker, kind of use counter punching and things like that to kind of have some success at times with Joshua. But here, I think the size difference is a little bit bigger, a little bit more. And remember, Usyk is now coming from cruiserweight and those guys still punching everything and the pace is faster. So what I think that he should probably try to do is like up the pace with Joshua. You know what I mean? Keep him turning and, and you know, being, you know, keep busy, keep him turning and, and try and you know try to get the left hand down the pike, but just keep him busy, keep him always on guard. I noticed that when he when Joshua fights smaller heavyweights, like even with um, uh, it wasn't a southpaw, but even with Pavetkin, you know, they, sometimes that being shorter is not necessarily the worst advantage for you. I mean, the worst situation for you when fighting Joshua. Seen the same thing with um, what's the what's the other guy's name? Um, dark skin kid guy. I can't remember his name right now. Ugh. That Joshua fought. He made it really like. At times, he was really making Joshua oh, miss a lot. Um, uh, Takam? Takam, yeah. Like, so, Joshua, and, and Joshua likes to use the uppercuts, and he likes to he likes to get in and throw combinations. So, you know what I mean? I I do feel like Usyk can still up the, like, maybe up the pace, keep it a little faster, but at the same time, keep him, keep him turning, keep him moving. You know what I mean? Maybe make it interesting. I, but it's, other than that, it's hard for me to make a case for him. Because it's just gonna be because he's not the biggest puncher. I mean, he's done. He's had good success at at cruiserweight, but as a heavyweight, I haven't really seen much. I mean, obviously with Chaz, but with Chaz, you know, Chaz was coming off of how how long of a layoff, and you know what I mean. He's he wasn't really himself. But just just looking at the situation is you don't think that he's gonna get in there and stop Anthony Joshua or catch him. So he's gonna have to look for a decision. So the only way I feel like he can do that is. Bend the range, and what I mean by that is in and out. Keep him guessing a lot of feints. You know what I mean. Try to try to be try not to get to, on the end of his shots, but at the same time, try not to be too close and get caught with combinations or putting yourself at risk. 
it's, I know it's, it's going to be a tough puzzle to solve uh, for you sick, to be honest, even though he, I think he, but I think he does have the pedigree to do it. He's just got to figure it out. And, um, you know, he's a, it's a tall task, you know, pun intended with Joshua being six, six and all that. But I think he can figure out something. And like I said, he can keep the pace high, make him work harder than he wants to work. Sometimes maybe put his foot on the gas a little bit more. I don't, I, I, and if he can get him a little bit gassy toward the end of the fight, maybe then he can start to possibly walk him down if he's tired, you know what I mean? And then make the fight a little more his, but as, as I'm looking at it now, and just thinking like, you know, from round one on, he's going to have to, he's going to have a danger zone. He's going to be in for the first three or four rounds. Right? I think Joshua would be real, da- real dangerous to walk in on. So I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to think of ways for you to be effective. And I shouldn't have to think of but so much. I mean, he's got a lot of, you know, a lot of ability, a lot of things that he does well. But at the heavy, in the heavyweight division, man, it's just, He's going to be on the on the small end on, on most of these, and and some of these guys like Anthony Joshua are really athletic, so it's it's hard to say if he can if he can if he can beat any of them. You know, I see the fight as a brilliant fight. I've been looking forward to the fight for ages. There's a hell of a lot of people, including myself, a tiny bit that felt the fight wouldn't even happen because it's such a risk. I think this fight mm-hmm. for Joshua, and I said it a long time ago. I picked. I picked you sick to win the fight a long time ago. I am actually sticking with that. Um, I want to kind of come to you about a couple of things that I that I uh, you know consider in my pick. Um, if the fight goes late, I think you sick would take over in that area. I don't think Anthony Joshua, you know, I don't think it's going to be a good thing if Anthony Joshua is in round ten, eleven, stuff like that. Um, which is which is weird because what I'm about to say is almost going to completely counter that um mm-hmm. anthony joshua hasn't got an early knockout since eric molina almost five years ago so that would say that he still bangs people out late like pulev in 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 the ninth round last time out um you know he beat ruiz obviously on points the fight before that uh, the fight before that he gets knocked out by ruiz in round seven but before that you know a win against pavetkin in round seven parker Decision 12, Takam, KO 10, Klitschko, KO 11. So um, I think the Joshua gas tank uh, kind of question marks have been answered. I think that, you know, he doesn't necessarily tire late on and doesn't carry his power late on, I think is probably more accurate. But uh, I still think that the later it goes, the more Usyk warms into it. I don't think Usyk's gas tank can be questioned at all. We've seen him you know, be in all kinds of fights against all all types of styles, against Michael Hunter, for example, against Derek Chisora, for example. Um, obviously, Usyk hasn't looked so great at heavyweight. That has to be took into account. Uh, the the yeah. Chisora fight was very, very, uh, you know, was, was quite hairy for him. And a lot of people were surprised by that. However, Chisora has that style. If he's bang up for a fight, gives anyone in the world a hard fight. Uh, Dillian White will, will tell you that one um, I just can't see Anthony Joshua knocking you sick out Eddie and that is something I have tried to envision for a while I just can't see him knocking him out and I certainly I certainly can't see it early on like I say it's almost been five years I can't see him knocking you sick out in like four or five rounds or anything like that I think it goes late and because it goes late I think you sick will take over um, just experience wise he's got such a deep pedigree amateur uh in terms of being an amateur much deeper than joshua um i i just think he's he's a box of tricks i think he's gonna bamboozle aj at times i think it's gonna be a chess match early on um mm-hmm. i think the mid rounds are gonna be very 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 important for both guys but i just think Usyk will take over i'm not sure if he's gonna get the decision mind you um, well, I'm all over the place with this I'm all over the place with this but I do think if I had to be pushed if I had mm-hmm. to be pushed I think it's I'm leaning towards a Usyk points win again I'm not sure if they're going to give it to him but I can also see I, I'm finding it easier to see Usyk getting the stoppage than Joshua late. getting the stoppage late huh? late on Could yeah be. late on yeah like, I can see like a round 10 round 11 kind of stoppage you know I, I I don't know. When you've seen, you know, you've, you, I've never seen you sick her. I've never seen him down. When you've seen what happened to Joshua against Ruiz and you just know how, 
for example, yep. Usyk looked against Tony Bellew. I don't know. You can you can it's see it happening true. again. But then again, yeah. Anthony Joshua's not Tony Bellew. You know, he's much bigger and stronger. I, I just don't know. I can see... I, I, can, I don't know, but it's weird. I can see the stoppage for Usyk much more than I can see the stoppage for Anthony Joshua. But my final prediction is a Usyk win on points, I think I'm going to say. I think it does go the distance. I, I really do. I, I think it goes the distance. I, you know what? I, I don't dislike what you're saying, Joe. And actually sounds really intelligent. Makes sense. Uh, it, and, but I can tell you from experience, I, I never see myself hurt or dropped or anything like that in a fight until I got the Vladimir. You understand what I'm saying? And just as easy as it's very difficult to see because you've never experienced that level. Now, of course he's experienced the level of boxing ability in front of him that he will with Anthony Joshua, not saying that Anthony Joshua is not a good fighter, but he's just experienced it with other fighters. You know what I mean? And he's probably experienced him possibly a higher level, but not this big of a guy. Pause. You understand? Not this big because he's he's a different animal in that, and then he will put punches together. Who's to say he doesn't get a couple off, it land clean? Then we'll really see what Usyk's chin is like. Now, if he has that granite type chin and he keeps coming, then I'm in complete backing your 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 uh, your pick in this fight because I do see a possibility of if it gets late and Joshua starts getting a little tired. I don't see him being in the same position as, say, a, a Vladimir Klitschko, where he's older. You know, his, his time is coming to an end, and he, he, you know, he, he's still got a lot of power, but just not enough defensive awareness to 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 stay in the fight. And when Joshua picked it up in the, at the end of the fight with uh, Klitschko, he just didn't have enough left to to fight him off. You know what I'm saying? He did all this fighting him off early in the fight, and it just didn't work out for him at the end. But with but with uh, Usyk. He's going to be there. I do agree with that. I feel like if he gets past those first five, six rounds without without any cat- catastrophic, you know, knockdowns or pain or, you know, get hurt or anything like that, I think I do honestly agree that there's a possibility that he can not only take a points win but maybe a late on stoppage because he's going to be there. He's going to be foot fainting them. He's going to be pressing them. And that's what I'm saying. He's going to have to do that. But he's going to have to walk through a, 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 a – <laughs> A lot, a lot of crap. You know what I mean? It's gonna be, it's gonna be a, a, a hurricane of, of crap he's gonna have to walk through, and uh, from from Anthony Joshua, I would imagine, if Anthony Joshua is lays like he should be, and if he's in a in a mood to box, kind of like what he did with with, with Ruiz, but a little more active because he's gonna have to be, I think, with Usyk because Usyk is definitely if I'm, if I know what I'm talking about, which I'm I may not, <laughs> Usyk's gonna be a lot busier with his movement not necessarily throwing a thousand punches but i feel like he's going to be a lot busier with his movement if he's going to press jo- if he's going to press joshua and joshua's going to be on the back foot he's going to press him with a lot more feints kind of like what if tyson fury was to fight joshua he would have a lot of foot feints a lot of up and down feints, shots shots going up and down just confusing them where they're coming from and i think that's a similar thing that's going to happen in this fight i just don't know how effective music will be able to be in the long term I mean, in the short term, you know, the first f- first round or so to 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 uh, to the sixth round, when I feel like he gets Anthony Joshua on the, on, on you know on toward the end of his gas tank, and then turns it up. If he can get that far without getting caught or getting hurt, he may have it, and I may have to you know I'll be eating crow because I <laughs> because I'm really I'm about to pick Joshua. Uh, probably I uh, would if I'm gonna say I don't want to say stoppage, but I feel like that's his. That's, I don't know. I, I don't even want to say. I, I don't want to say because I, I'm in agreement with you. I've never seen you sick hurt, so I can't really say that that's gonna happen in this fight. But I feel like Joshua probably, if he's gonna get him, he's definitely gonna get him like mid mid rounds. But I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I just can't see it. I just cannot see, it, especially mid rounds. And you know, I go back to that earlier point about him not getting a. You know, a knockout in less than seven rounds for almost five yeah. years. You know, and um, they, they were, I think there was just the one against Povetkin in that kind of time zone, but uh, time frame. Sorry. Um, no, it's a, it's a great fight. It's a great fight. I, I think that yeah, Usyk has to be 
very mobile, as you say. Of course, he has to be. It's it's, it's a no brainer. But I think mm. that if it comes into the fight where, or it comes a point in the fight where one man is being backed up and one man's being pushed back, that you think it's music, yeah. No, nah, yeah, that's to... what I mean. I think if if you allow Anthony jo- Joshua to push you back and bully you, the writing's yeah. almost on the wall. Um, I think. If if Joshua is pushed back though, which we know Usyk can do, he can come in, you know, different angles, stuff like that, different punches. Um, he's certainly got the ability to do it. If he can do that, then Joshua's in a in a, in a whole heap of trouble himself. Um, but I think Usyk should, you know, not go back in straight lines. I think he's much smarter than that. Anyway, I think it's going to be, I, I think he's going to be a little bit Lomachenko esque in terms of the way he pops up with different punches from different angles and yeah. stuff like that. That's what I think is going to happen. I don't think it's going to be back and forth. I think it's going to kind of be a bit of a chess match in the middle of the ring, Eddie, actually. I hope, uh, for, for Usyk's sake, I hope that that's really what it is. But this is why, and I'm going to give you a reason why I say I hope he doesn't get caught with anything that even wobbles him because then that's going to force Andy Joshua to say, well, let me get this guy the hell out of here as soon as I can. And then he might succeed. And the reason why I'm saying that is because Andy Joshua is a, will be a combination puncher if he sees you. If he sees any little flicker of you being hurt, he's going to turn that thing up to a thousand. And that's why we've seen with Andy Ruiz. But that's exactly why he's got he got stopped with Andy Ruiz. I don't think that Usyk is the puncher that Andy Ruiz is. So I don't know that he can make him pay quite as bad a bigger price that early as what Andy Ruiz did. But I feel like Joshua's shot is to maybe, like I said, catch him early and then just be real busy. And it's like when I look at a guy like Usyk, I don't want to extend this too much, but when I look at a guy like Usyk, um, when he gets comfortable, he can be dominant, right? And especially with his boxing ability, he can be really dominant. So it's like if you're going to get into a fight, it's kind of like I remember hearing Andy Lee say it. Somebody told me Andy Lee said this about if he was to fight a guy like Floyd or somebody, he would be like, I wouldn't be fighting them for a decision. I would be fighting them to get him out of there because there's no way that I'm going to beat this guy in a decision over a long fight. I my best hope is to give it all I got up six up to six rounds and if I'm not if he's not gone by six, my chances my my time is my time is passed. You understand what I'm saying? So what I'm looking at and I know this sounds ridiculous cuz Anthony Joshua was the man, he's supposed to be the man, but if if Usyk gets in there and proves that not only is he able to hold his own but he's in control and Joshua's gonna have to treat it just like that he's gonna have to treat it like look I didn't come in here <laughs> to wait to win a decision or at least you know me adjusting I'm gonna have to adjust to the fact that I'm not gonna beat this guy by decision I gotta get him out of here and I feel like that's why I'm saying if he's gonna win the fight may, especially if he starts to get comfortable uh you sick he's gonna have to get him out of there from the beginning to the middle when he's at his strongest because if he doesn't by then He's going to be struggling late on. Yeah, no, you make excellent points, Eddie, as always uh, you, you do. But I just want to look back at, and, and again, this is going to be very brief. I just want to end on this. Um, and I'm not a Joshua hater at all. Like, I can honestly say I've met the guy a number of times. He's a guy that walks in the room, the whole room lights up. Um, you know, it's, he's a special, special individual. I, I, I'm telling you that now. I've been, a, you know, been near him enough times and... He's got that about him. He, he really does. I'm not sure Tyson Fury has it, to be completely honest, but he does. He's got something special about him. But back to the fighting. Um, when you talk about... Because I want to kind of think about who is the best opponent that Anthony Joshua has knocked out. Um, and and you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to really think about that. Who would you say, Eddie, is the best opponent he's knocked out, in your opinion? Because I think it's either... 39 years of age, Povetkin, 39 years of age, Pulev, or 41 years of age, Vladimir Klitschko. They're all 40 years old. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I would probably say Vladimir, but to to mirror the fight the best, I would probably say uh, Povetkin to mirror this fight because, you know, Povetkin is nearer the same size, maybe a little shorter, to be be honest, than... um, uh, than uh, Yusik. And I'm looking at the way Pavekin fought him, and he fought him tough. Tricky, crafty, good puncher. 
but you know, not a, a, a real, real, real knockout guy. Not saying that actually P- Povetkin actually could knock you out, but you know, um, yeah. and I just think that if we're gonna look at you know, those similarities, I'm like, yeah. And I feel like Usyk is a much better defensive guy than any of those fighters we mentioned, which makes that's what makes the fight interesting, and that's what makes the fight going to the late rounds. And he's like you said, Joe. You made this point by saying he's younger. <laughs> Obviously, he's younger, but he's in the prime and he's really ready to go at this point. I mean, he's really ready to become a star. So he's looking at he's looking at it that way. Like I, I in, without a doubt, in my mind, when when Yusuf gets in there, he's looking like I'm about to just destroy this guy. And you know what? I'm not taking off. My, I'm not going on. You know, I'm not reneging on my pick. But I am saying, I can see it happening. A hundred percent. I could see it happening when the fight was signed and when we was talking about it before. It's not impossible. And really, I should be backing you, Sick, because he's more like me in this scenario than than the other way around. But it's just um, if, if I'm going to watch this fight and think that a guy like this is going to win 90 percent of the time, 95 percent of the time it will be by decision. I just don't know if he's going to be able to get that. So I'm gonna have to go with the, the 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 my my decision would be to go with Joshua mid rounds, and the reason is because he can't allow Usyk to get comfortable, and if he allows Usyk to get comfortable, he's then gonna be struggling late, and you know what could happen there, and um, I just don't think I think once he starts to realize early on, especially if Usyk is sharp, he's like I'm not waiting on this dude to be pot shot me at the end of the fight. Hell no. And he starts picking up the pace, and he may catch him, which I'm figuring is probably going to end up happening early. Maybe he gets him in the middle rounds. But, and I feel like, honestly, that's probably his best bet. That, that's just me saying it. Now. But we'll see what happens, Joe. We'll see what happens. But, yeah, you know, on, on Anthony Joshua's, um, you know, career, there's there's a lot of knockouts against guys who are old. Obviously, we're not going to even go into Matt Skelton and Michael Sprott and Kevin Johnson, people like that, but... You know, I mentioned the knockout of Vladimir Klitschko, the knockout of Alexander Povetkin, and the knockout of Pulev, all guys that were 39 or 41. Um, his other knockouts against people that I'd say are more so in their prime would be an Eric Molina, Dominic Brazil, or Charles Martin, but how good were they? The only one that is a really good one, I think, against a guy who was young enough was Dillian White. I mean, you can't take that away from him. Great great way to do it but again Usyk I think is head and shoulders above all those guys but I could be wrong that's just what I think I I think like all my money is on it going into the second half of the fight and it's going to be interesting who's got the gas in the tank who's got the power and who's you know who's winning on the judges scorecards that's what I think will be interesting but I think it, it probably goes the distance um, but anyway, that's it. We've spoke about it for long enough there. That is it for the preview part of the show. Just before we wrap this up, the final thing for me to do is to come in with the outro, which I'll do in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 310 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A huge thank you to our special guest, the undefeated number one ranked super lightweight by the WBO in the world, Mr. Jack Catterall. An even bigger thank you, of course, to you, the listeners, for helping us get to where we've gotten to. Six years of podcasting. It's the six-year anniversary this week. It's been unbelievable. So a huge thank you to yourselves for that. A huge Huge thank you also to our sponsor, Manscaped. Remember to check their website out and use the code BOXHARD for 20% off and free shipping. You will not be disappointed. But that's about everything from myself. Enjoy your weekends, people. Stay safe, and we shall see you all again next week.